Hello and welcome to the Gaelic Football Show here on Off The Ball. We're live on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. Uh, joining me today is Matty Ford, Wexford legend. How are you doing, Matty? Afternoon, Shane. You've been playing club football now, for senior club football, for how long? Um, last 2018 would have been my 25th season playing adult. Um, I had played a year or two a junior and uh, played senior for 23 years after that, so 25 years of adult altogether. It feels like you you retired from inter-county seven or eight years ago because the body couldn't take it anymore. So how are you still playing club? Um, 2010 was, so I suppose, this is the ninth year that I won't have been playing at Wexford. Um, I suppose my the back injury I had that, that finished me playing at Wexford, I suppose, has really um, improved over the last couple of years in particular. And... Uh, Obviously, not having as big a workload with playing WEC, playing inter county, and playing club, and playing dual club as well um, has definitely been a has definitely been a help. And I suppose the older you get, you realise you know you're getting a bit closer to the end, and you want to kind of I suppose drag it out as long as you can at that stage. Not playing dual club, so you were a hurler as well. Yeah, I played hurling up to I think about 2011 or 12 as well. But after that injury, I realised playing one was very tough, and playing two just wasn't just wasn't going to cut it. So I had to pick one over the other. So, so it was probably always going to be football. You were one of the rare lads then that went with the football over the hurling. Actually, was hurling an option for you at county level? Um, I suppose people say if I had been playing enough hurling, I could have been in the Wexford Senior Hurling Panel or team at some stage. Look, at the, the, honestly, we'll never know. We were playing intermediate hurling most of the time, and we were a football club who would have played probably 70, 30 uh, football all the way up along. Um, look, I suppose we're not going to know at this stage, but uh, no, look, I'm, I, I don't regret my decision to, to play, play football at Wexford at all for, for a minute. And you ha you've had some great success with Kilnairn in the last couple of years even. Like you won a Leinster Intermediate title and then last year got to the county final and senior. Yeah, look, we, we were relegated in 2014, I think it was, and it was obviously one of the biggest lows of both the club and, and my career. And, you know, at that stage I was kind of struggling, I, but I said I wanted to kind of keep playing if I could to, to get back senior. I started with Kyle Nairn as a senior club and I, I would like to have left him there. So, yeah, we won the Intermediate Club Championship in 17 and then went on to win Leinster and were beaten in the all Ireland semi-final by Michael Glavies and yeah, went straight to the county final last year and lost after a replay to, to Sean Lears. What was it like winning that Leinster title last year? Unbelievable because you know the only Leinster title I had um, was a school's one. I played in obviously the Leinster Senior Football Final in Dublin in 2008 which didn't go very well. Um, so it's just a 23 point loss. Just a 23 point loss. Yeah, God bless your memory. Thanks <laughs> very much. Um, I was trying to forget about it. Uh, but look at the win one with your club um, with friends, lads you grew up with. I had three nephews playing that day. It was just it was, it was, it was fantastic. So it'll be something that'll live with me forever. Mm. And you'll play on this year? Um, I'm not sure too sure about that to be honest. I haven't I haven't trained yet. Um, I may play a bit of a bit of junior later on in the year and I, I, I may not. I, I actually haven't even decided so I'll see how the how the year progresses. Might be might be hard to juggle with considering your job driving around a minister. Um, uh, look, it's been hard for the last two or three years, two or three years doing it. But uh, the fact that he's our club chairman is a is a little <laughs> bit of a help, and he kind of understands the, the lie of the land as well. So now, look, that's that's not going to be a, a serious consideration. And it's my own body and t telling me it's time to, to pack it in and quit while I'm ahead. And I'm sure those listening now are curious what minister it is that you drive around. I'm sure they probably are. I look, at he's I said he's chairman of our club, so I think it wouldn't be a big one to figure that out. He's deputy minister for for finance, uh, Michael Darcy. Yeah, I'm sure you hear plenty of wild stuff in the car. <laughs> I don't really joke. I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually press you on that. Uh, just, uh, you, you mentioned 2008 there with Wexford. You got to the Leinster final, got to an All-Ireland semi-final as well. Brilliant stuff. In the 11 years since, now down in Division 4, where have things gone wrong? Um, you know, a lot of people have asked me this in the last couple of years. Even though know, things started to slip kind of after 2008, um, I think our, our biggest issue in Wexford has been our underage coaching or our lack of it um, in football. And I think that's why we are where we are. Um, we have we have very little been done. Um, I know Anthony Masters has gone in now and has started doing an excellent job, but it's only in the last year and a half, and that's probably you know within a half a generation away of, of bearing fruit. And it, uh, if he stays there, I think it absolutely will. I think he's doing a great job, um, but I think that has been our single one biggest issue. And I think you can put literally put it down to something as simple as that. That team we had in 08 was a very good minor team that came through. Um, from around, I think from 1998, along with a couple of us lads that were a year or two um, ahead of those. Um, I think that's why, and uh, that was a strong minor team was beaten, I think actually in a Leinster final replay by Dublin as well. Um, so, you know, that was one particularly good team that came together and then I think you throw in a couple of really good managers, you had like Pat Rowe and Jason Ryan, um, that, that brought us on to kind of a different level. Um, but as I said, our lack of coaching, our lack of um, underage investment um, in every sense, 
uh, since then has been has been our big downfall. And I think that's why we find ourselves where we are. And to be honest, it's it's no major surprise, unfortunately. Mm. And, that, and like and then, when you consider that the let's say for example on the hurling side of things JJ Doyle would have been over the under 21s and they won three Leinster under 21 titles in a row and you're thinking well Wexford is flying it at underage level in hurling yeah. so was it a case that Wexford football is not you know there's not as much put into it as there is in hurling I, in my opinion I, th- that's absolutely right and as I said we, we haven't really invested in underage football coaching where we definitely have in hurling and you know we had we won two Leinster under 21 titles and ran two semi, all Ireland semi-finals um, in either in, within the space of two or three years and there's very very few of them guys that come through I know there's always going to be the issue in Wexford of guys playing dual which would have been in those teams and very good guys on hurling teams that can play football but it was the, we had the very same um, pro- well not even problem we had the same issues in 2008 and you know the, the hurling and football teams still survived alongside each other and in my opinion they still should be Yeah, um, and like at that time the likes of Red Barry for example would have been playing football and the hurlers would have wanted him as well definitely uh, mm. um, himself uh, Red uh, Red, sorry, Brian Malone, Kieran Ling, I suppose, would have been the biggest two or three guys we would have had that absolutely would have been on the Hurling team or Hurling panel. Um, and they all decided to choose football. But yeah, there's a couple of really good um, footballers on the Hurling panel now, but that was always the case. And there was even some good guys then. Dara Ryan was a fantastic footballer. Damien Fitzhenry was a fantastic footballer. And you know you could just keep going because all, 99% of these guys in Wexford play a duel anyway. Yeah, because everyone just thinks Lee Chin, if you, you know what, that he would be the main one. But yeah. there are plenty of other guys as well. Yeah, no, Simon Donoghue, I think, is he? Simon Donoghue has pl- played with us um, in, 16, in 15 and 16, I think, and he decided to choose Hurling. Look at absolutely fair play to him. Colin Kyo went over last year and came back, and now he's not in the squad at all. You know, he's he's nursing a lot of injuries. Um, but there's there's guys every year, and I'm sure there's probably a couple of guys in the football panel that mightn't, you know, with the proper commitment, mightn't be 100 miles off the Hurling team either. I often think then about the, I think it was the 2011 Leinster final when Wexford probably should have beaten Dublin that day. James McCarthy might have uh, popped up with a goal that day. Bit of a sliding doors moment almost that yeah. maybe that would have kept more people with the, the football rather than transferring over to the football or y- hurling. Yeah, look, it, it seems to be kind of a turning point. And I don't because I don't think it was because we lost the Leinster final. I think as a lot of that the generation of players we had from the 08 semi final who were still there in, in 2011, the likes of Red and David Murphy and Anthony Masters and Colin Morris, they they gradually started to drift away. And not only were the good players drifting away, they were real proper leaders that we had, and even had as young fellas and um, I think it's no surprise and, and certainly in terms of quality and I think in terms of leadership the likes of these lads haven't been replaced since which is obviously another another big problem we have. Yeah. So would it be a bit simplistic then because you're talking about the underage, underage coaching and lack of it that Davy Fitz coming along was the last thing that the Wexford footballers needed because he was going to bring a lot of razzmatazz. Oh he has look in fairness and there was, there was plenty when, when we started playing with Wexford there was plenty of razzmatazz with Wexford hurling but I think you kind of have to forge your own path but you need that bit of quality there to it and I don't think that's taken away from the underage coaching in the football sense I just think it has never been there or has never been properly um, organised and I think that's our biggest problem you know we have the likes of Good Council and St Peter's who are, who are ultra successful in Leinster schools football mm-hmm. and hurling by the way but um, you know we have to be able to channel these fellas into a, a county set up somewhere along the line you know and as, and as I keep saying there's enough to go around it to play hurling and to play football So at the moment Paul McLaughlin has a team mid-table in Division 4 um, having won a provincial Championship match since 2014. Colin Kelly is after coming in the former Louth and Westmead coach. So uh, is is that a good step? Do you feel confident going into the the Louth Championship ma- match? Well, I think the, the couple of wins the lads have got under their belt, you know, in the last few weeks against um, Wicklow and against Limerick. I think you know victories and success breeds a bit more success, and that'll be a huge help. Um, you know, they're up in Derry this weekend, and that's going to be a tough one. I think they're only travelling up the day of the game, and Derry are on it on a real high I think they're the only unbeaten team in the in the entire league um, with, with a full six from six so but look they have a, a league final next week but I think uh, regardless of that you know he, I think Colin definitely will be helping you know he's been there and done it as a manager it was a bit of a strange situation when I heard it that you know the first round of the championship is obviously against Loud yeah. um, but look he said he's just coming in to try and assist another team he's obviously not in against Loud and stuff like that but I said he has the experience of uh, coaching at that level and uh, you know I think I've just only read I think either this morning or yesterday where himself and Paul are, have been have been friendly for a long time so you know that that will definitely help it's not as if they're, they're two kind of fellas that don't know each other coming in to start yeah. working together Not to put a damn squib on it now but uh, Colin's record as a manager is three wins from 11 championship matches so hopefully for Wexford that changes uh, Moving on to Tyrone's win against Dublin 114-111 at Croke Park um, when we were talking on Off the Ball the evening show last Thursday 
a big point I made was because of how Tyrone had lost so poorly in the All Ireland final last year that they really, really needed this win. Did you think they did? And like, can that be a big turning point for them in terms of whether they've got mental scars with Dublin? Yeah, look, it's their first win against them in six seasons, which I was kind of surprised at to hear the other day. And I think, you know, it definitely can be a turning point. I've also said kind of that you can't read too much into the league, neither good nor bad, with a lot of teams, particularly the teams in Division One, because they're Division One teams. Because when it comes to it, they can they can they can turn it on. And Tyrone are certainly one of those teams. You know, to get to an Ireland final, you know, you have to go and have to go and beat some good teams, and that's what they've done that last year. You know, six points defeat to Dublin. You know, it's not it's not a twenty point defeat or anything like that. It's not as if there's a huge chasm between the two teams. So, but I think it definitely will be in help to them, and particularly the way they played. Um, but as I said, look, you don't know what teams are doing this time of the year. Dublin may or may not be in a part of the season where they're doing some heavy training at the moment as they're only back quite late and you know, I thought they looked a bit leggy but again teams often look like that when they're getting beaten in matches um, but you know for, from Tyrone's point of view you know, it's, it's the most football I've seen a Tyrone team playing in, in, a, in a long number of years and, and really really good quality football as well And there's good resilience too because after the red card they won yeah. the remainder of the game 3 points to 2 which I would have thought maybe they'll start to fall away Some other things that stood out to me was Kieran McGeary playing as a sweeper he's such a great footballer but you'd normally expect him to be further up the field thought he did really really well so anything else that stood out particularly to you about them? Um, well it's just it's, it's a lot of teams I think kind of end up with a, often a defender playing as a sweeper which is kind of common sense but you know in essence this sweeper is going to be a guy that's free he's going to be a guy that's on a huge amount of ball you know you want a really good footballer on the ball the whole time you know we're making analogies now to calling them quarterbacks um, a bit like you know uh, Niall Morgan did with a couple of kickouts and stuff like that or Rory Began does or the um, the Corrafin goalkeeper the other day they're going to be on the ball a lot of time uh, with a bit of time and you know you want really good quality players in that position but you know the one thing for me that that struck me about Tyrone the other night was you know playing with with forwards up the field and kicking an awful lot of long ball and you know people have been saying over the last couple of months that you know the high direct ball in causes Dublin problems high direct ball into any full back line causes problems um, mm. because defenders don't want one on ones and the Tyrone lads got a lot of them the other night and one on one and the physical condition of these Tyrone lads are, are most of these players and any of these players in Division 1 one on one is not a nice place for mm. a defender to be and we'll actually come to a couple of images in a few minutes but another point I wanted to make like one warning sign I'd give for Tyrone own is, and maybe this is a byproduct of trying to get the ball up a little bit quicker, is that how often that they panicked in, panicked with kicked possession. So Colin Nally we had in here a few weeks ago and he was talking about how Dublin, when they get the ball up the field and if they're presented with a wall, they're very patient on the ball and they normally don't turn it over. So just during the first half there, I kind of noted a few times that Tyrone did panic with kick passes. So Pat McGeary early, uh, he panicked in possession and it led to Dublin counter-attacking for the Cormac Costello goal. Kieran McGeary did it, Ron McNamee did it uh, a couple of times, and Conor Myler did it as well. And I just wonder, why, why is that happening? Is it a lack of patience, or is it a case of, well, we need to kick it in, so, you know, it's just part of it, you're going to lose a few. It's probably a bit of both. The law of average says the more times you kick the ball, because that's going to be a longer pass, the more times you're going to lose it. And also, it's something to me that they've only started doing over the last couple of months. You know, their early games in the league was an awful lot of running, an awful lot of carrying, they weren't kicking the ball. So it's something they're obviously only... Um, to, to possibly only started over the last number of weeks and you know Dublin who are still you know, one of the best teams if not the best team in the country you know they're going to get bodies behind the ball as well even though we all say they're an attacking team which they are but don't, you're going to turn the ball over yeah. um, and Dublin have become very good it was one of the first things I noticed about the, that Dublin team how comfortable they were in possession um, against blanket defences the ball was worked side to side and back and forth till eventually a gap appeared a hole appeared or a kick pass was on um, and Tyrone mightn't have got there yet but I think they're certainly going the right direction Do you think do you like watching Dublin? Do you think they're a boring team, exciting team? Absolutely, and I've said that, you know, at this stage, a lot of people are sick of Dublin winning, but I said, you know, once they keep playing football like that, they're a joy to watch. Absolutely, to get a lot of bodies behind the ball, but their, their transition, as we call it now in GA, but the way they attack, they're scoring, they're free flowing, everybody is comfortable on the ball. And I was talking to an ex Dublin player only a couple of years ago, and, you know, it was kind of fairly obvious anyway. And I said, you know, what was the big difference in Gavin, or what have they been doing different the last couple of years? And he said, they've just really gone after the basics, and every one of them, their basics is really, really good. Their kick passing is really good, 
hand passing is really good, they're tackling, they're wor- everything. And it really is just to do the basics better than everyone else and can do it for longer with, with more bodies. We'll go up to the tactics board late, later and, you know, as a Wexford forwards coach at one point as well, we might get some thoughts on how you would coach forwards these, these days in terms of movement as well. Um, just one thing that stood out from the game as well, and I think the Niall Morgan shoulder, which resulted in Paddy Andrews getting a broken jaw, it seemed more mistimed than anything, but it felt in some ways that it was kind of symptomatic of a game that went overboard at times. So a couple of images just coming up on the screen here as well. This was in the first half. Um, I think it's uh, Zach Colin McShane. He'd won a mark and then it just seemed a little bit unnecessary from uh, Johnny Cooper that has left his foot across his forearm. We've another um, shot coming up here. Matty Donnelly wins a ball and that's that's a little a little kick out from James McCarthy. Again, it's not going to hurt Matty Donnelly but just seemed unnecessary. And then the, the final image we have coming up here, of course, is Niall Morgan going in on Paddy Andrews. Um, did you think it goes a little overboard? Stills, um, I think, are kind of a bit unfair. You, you, you can't really judge a fella on a still. When you see the actual footage, um, particularly of the of the Niall Morgan, I, in my opinion, and it's literally only my opinion, I'm sure there'll be, there'll be tweets or something like that about it. it does look bad because, you know, in that position as a goalkeeper, you know, if Paddy Andrews happens to turn the other way, he's slipped Niall Morgan and he's probably kicking the ball. I know he's out to the, yeah. to the left-hand side of the goal uh, looking into the hill end, but if he turns the other way... Um, He's kicking the ball into an empty net, or has the potential to kick the ball into an empty net. So, you know, you prefer your goalkeeper there to be getting his hands out and trying to shepherd him, trying to hold him up till he gets a small bit of support, and that goal chance is not on. But you know, he, the, the still doesn't look, look doesn't look good. But uh, you know, the actual footage is not is not doesn't look great either, to mm. be honest. But look, he's got he's got a yellow card. Nobody knows where he meant. He's I've actually seen on Twitter since that you know he's he's um you know he regrets of, of Paddy Andrews getting injured. So. Look, at, you have to take his word for it. Yeah, I've I've a feeling if they meet later on in the summer as well, there could be. Yeah, look at look at it, it, teams like this to have rivalries. It's the same with Dublin Mayo. There's always a bit of needle. And to be honest, look at people say we don't want to see this this kind of stuff in the game. Where you know, like like the end of the Kerry Dublin game, there's not too many people turned off when it comes on at the same time. So you know, you can't say you don't want to see it. You don't want to see guys getting badly hurt. Absolutely no way. But you know, a bit of needle in championship matches. That that's why they're championship matches. If they weren't. Their friendlies or their, their league matches, and, and there, there is going to be a bit of a bit of needle there with Dublin and Tyrone and Dublin and plenty of other teams as well. And of course, the, uh, Paddy Andrews, who knows how long he'll be out for, and it kind of brought to mind for Enda McGinley, who was on off the ball AM this morning, that uh, there's one player that should come back into the fold for Dublin now. I've always sort of said Dublin's strength in terms of their attacking play is that in terms of their six forwards, they don't, they're not reliant on a real star man. It's everybody is so good in there that everybody's their own star man and everybody's worth a watching. But it was interesting on, on Saturday night for the first time, you could see the fact that they were missing whenever the team was misfiring, the fact that they were missing that go-to player, that player with something different, that player who was their, their on-field leader, they were missing that, that star to sort of go to whenever the team was struggling you get your star of the ball and, and they'll work something you know it's safe with them and so you just look at who they're missing and you sort of think again Jim Gavin is now in a situation he would never have thought he would be in so from a throne point of view you were saying at the start uh, that we're, we're delighted with the win absolutely well, have we woken the beast possibly will Jim Gavin start looking at his options that are playing club football in, in Dublin at the minute he very likely will but do you mean, uh, do you mean Dear McConnell? Yeah, so, are you talking yeah. Dear McConnell? pardon are you talking about Dear McConnell? Yeah, I, I think the likes of Connolly, possibly the likes of Rory O'Carroll, though I think he, he's further away from the mix. But he, I just thought that that Dublin forward line on Sunday, and funny, a good friend of mine, Stevie Quinn, mentioned to me, they, they were missing that that go-to player. Whenever whenever the, the rest of them were struggling, you just love to have that go-to player that you just know he's got something else and that really, really isn't capable of being man-marked and Jermaine Connolly is certainly a very obvious candidate for that for that type of role. Matty, should Dublin chase after Jermaine Connolly? Um, I don't know about chasing after him as a football supporter. I'd love to see him playing again. Um, I think he can just do f- things on the football field that nobody else is capable of doing. But look, at you bring him back in... Um, 
I think all things being equal, he adds obviously an awful lot of quality, but you have more competition again, it freshens thing up a little bit because you could basically say he wasn't there last season, um, got seen very little game time. So, you know, like I think Carmen Costello has been a huge plus for Dublin during the National League. He's one fella that's really put his hand up and to find it hard, I think, not to start. You know, he gets the ball, he wants to score goals. Um, and that's what Jim Gavin loves, you know, a bit like Kevin McMenamin a couple of seasons ago. But, um, you know, if I was a Dublin footballer or Dublin football supporter, I certainly wouldn't mind seeing him being, being back at training, I think. Mm. I, should add, uh, I should add that we've added Owen Shane into the mix here. Owen, how are you doing? Very well. Good. Just one other question about Connolly then as well. He's a guy who attracts a lot of media attention over the years and generally gets a, I don't know, a lot of focus if there's a negative thing. What's that like for a footballer? Um, look, at it can't be easy because the good stuff he does outweighs the bad you know, 100 to 100 times to 1 and you know there seems to be an awful lot of attention on him the whole time. Um, it's probably not that easy to be honest. I don't think I've got a bit of attention over the years but I don't think it's anything like he's received and you know it's constant from minute 1 to minute 70 in a match and you know I've actually said it before that it, it, it can find it a bit harsh you know absolutely he's no angel nor was I but um, I think most of us just go out to play football be a backer forward you just go out to play football and you know you don't need it. Some people say it's oh look it's part of the game but it's not. Um, we were never coached at any stage to go out and get in fellas ears and get in their faces and stuff like that so you know why should, why should anyone have to put up with it? And, and if there is a bad headline about you, is that really tough on you or your family? Like, is the water off a duck's back to you to some extent? Ah, no, look, at back during the, the, the incident I had with Shane Sullivan in, in 2006 where I, where I walked him in Croke Park, you know, that was, it was tough for me, but it was very tough for my family as well, which, you know, has no place in it. I done it. Um, I was the one to have to put up with it. Um, you know, they shouldn't, but, you know, look, it get support as well. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we keep saying that these lads have to go up and go to work the next morning and, you know, having headlines like that and about you in the national paper, you know, you're not playing rugby, you're not playing soccer for Ireland, you're not a professional and obviously getting paid for it. So, you know, you, you have to go and, and live a life as well. And, you know, I think I think we're being a little bit harsh on some of our players at, at times. Mm. And then just moving back to the, the high balls that you were talking about between, uh, like Tyrone very much went after the high ball the other day. We have a couple of images coming up here. We can see this one early on. I think this was one where um, where Burns probably... Sh yeah, this was the one that went high ball in and broke. Colin McShane picked up the ball and a missed hand pass for Burns to end up uh, getting a goal chance as well. So it very obviously, that was a very good chance for them. Second one uh, here, I think it was a Frank Burns long ball straight into McShane. He catches it directly over Davy Byrne and blasts it over the bar. And I think we've one more coming in. Yeah, this is just Peter Hart find himself in an acre of space and somehow catches a high ball over his head as well. So, I mean, it, it, what, what is the effect of this going to be for Dublin? Because they're going to see that the likes of Throne are going after the high ball. They're going to see Davy Burns possibly going to struggle under high ball. Maybe Keno Sullivan might struggle under high ball. Uh, Johnny Cooper, especially if you're up against Matty Donnelly, Carl McShane and maybe Peter Hart. Yeah. So, if you're Dublin, what's your reaction to seeing this? Um, obviously, I think Philly McMahon going back in there will be a help. You know, he's he's a he's a huge man with a huge presence around the edge of the square as well. But the one thing, kind of from even from the stills there, every time a high ball landed in, it was nearly three on three, four on four, where the Dublin defender I think had to take a chance and play in front because if he didn't with the mark, I know we won't have it during the championship, but in the mark during the national league, you play the defender from behind, he's either a great chance of, of winning the mark in front, um, but also the Dublin defender behind, if he broke it, he wasn't breaking necessarily to a Dublin sweeper that wasn't there because I said. A lot of the time it's three on three or four on four where Tyrone, maybe Tyrone actually surprised Dublin with playing as many men up the mm. field and kind of going at them and pushing up on them uh, man on man. But, um, you know, look at as I said, I think it's a concern for any team. One on one, high ball coming in. You know, if it breaks the wrong way, it's in the goal. You know, at least a far wins a ball out in front, you have a great chance to defend them. You're talking about holding them up by in two, three, four seconds. All of a sudden, there's three extra guys back. You know, your, the problem's eradicated. I, I agree with that. I, like, I, I'm very interested in Dublin's in-game management because it's something we've spoken about so much about how they're so good at figuring a situation out. And I think as well, uh, like you said, that they thought that Toronto maybe wouldn't commit as many bodies forward so that they didn't really feel the need of a solid sweeper in there. So why didn't the Dublin players themselves figure that out or get the, the, a runner on to actually change that mid-game? It's a surprisingly bad game management from Dublin, is it? Um, I don't know about bad game management. I was saying to Shane earlier on, Dublin could possibly be in the, in, in the middle of three, four, five weeks hard training. We just actually have, no one has a clue what's going on. But it is something that you have, kind of have to sort out. And it's not something you've associated with Dublin is panicking over the last five or six years. But um, I think the fact that Tyrone has said definitely had more players up the field, kind of from midfield up when they were attacking. Um, I think it drew out these Dublin. What we call they're not. I don't. I don't agree that they're sweepers. All they are is defenders playing as defenders at the end of the day. But it did draw them out that bit to push up on the Tyrone forwards that were rather been in the half back line during the half forward line. When you when you talk about um, figuring things out. Mid 
in the middle of a game. How many people does a, an inter-county team, and I don't know if you know Dublin's case or not, but how many people would they have watching different sectors of the field to see the matchups, or would it generally just be Jim and his selector or the manager and a couple uh, of selectors? Look, as I said, we don't know about Dublin, but I'm sure there is, there is more than that. And uh, I said, look, we've we no idea what kind of a block of training they're in, what was going on. They may have kind of not threw their hat at the league, but just decided, look, at the champ, look at the end of the day, no one is going to remember this league match in, in mm. six weeks' time. It is or, good that uh, we've got new finalists, though. A fresh pair. Uh, absolutely, yeah. and it's good. Look, at, they're going to have a new champion for the first time in a few years. But uh, realistically, no one's going to remember this league game in, in six or eight weeks' time, or when the Super Ace comes around. If Dublin play their own, this uh, this this actual match happens again. I think that game is going to have very little bearing on what happens then. Mm. Well, when you were down in Tralee for um, for Kerry's win over Dublin, and uh, something that stood out that day is that James McCarthy went back full back on Tommy Walsh at some stage. I'm sure that's the last thing Dublin would want to do, taking him out of the middle eight and some, some spot there. And I know Philly McMahon's coming back, Michael Fitzsimons is coming back, but that might end up being their go-to, their sort of fireman if things go wrong against the big man because Tyrone definitely looked dangerous with McShane, Donnelly and Hart up there. Yeah, definitely. I think the key thing as well, though, is that there's just a bit of chaos that seems to be setting in when that ball goes in on top of the Dublin full back line. It's not necessarily the idea that the new advanced mark has created some sort of newfound way of beating this Dublin team or causing them a bit of problem because a lot of that ball isn't actually being won cleanly and that was definitely the case down in Chile when James McCarthy went back there they didn't care that the ball wasn't being won cleanly or that marks weren't being won the ball was just going in there and there was a bit of chaos happening and it is unusual to see uh, that chaos resulting in something negative for Dublin because they tend to thrive in that sort of environment now the thing is they've, be, they've benefited hugely from the, the process in the past of just flooding uh, an area of the pitch when, uh, when an attack has the ball, um, creating a ruck if you like, and uh, getting the free out ultimately because that that's what a referee will give. So the new rule does help them in that regard. So there will be a tweak. It won't be as dramatic come the summertime, but I still think that it is a, a good sign if you're one of the the people who don't want to see Dublin go for five in a row. But what what does Peter Hart do about breaking the stranglehold of John Small? Because Peter Hart became very influential later in the game. Small went off after 31 minutes. He just couldn't seem to get into the game. Have you ever had that where there's somebody who tags you and you really struggled with them but eventually found a way? Absolutely. I think it, it, it just... It happens anyway. Um, I said games as they go on will, will naturally open up. Um, you know, uh, players are always far more concentrated to start the games and it, it, it generally starts to dwindle a small bit with tiredness and concentration and stuff like that as the game goes on but look at it may have been the case that Dublin had had a good bit more possession at the start of the game which was you know obviously meant that Peter Hart couldn't be the influence but you know once a team has possession and he can get in the ball he, he's really going to uh, he will influence the game absolutely every time but one person we haven't mentioned with Dublin's I wouldn't even call him defensive issues at this stage to be honest it's way too soon for stuff like that but he mentioned that he's back in the country as Rory O'Carroll so you know, if Rory O'Carroll and Dear McConnelly was back in the Dublin fold along with Mick Fitzsimons and, and uh, Philly McMahon, you know, I think Dub uh, rumours of Dublin's demise could be a bit more <laughs> greatly exaggerated. And I don't think that, I don't, I don't agree that that's what we're saying, but, you know, maybe he could be an option to go in at, at full back because he's, he's been there and done it and, and knows exactly what's, what's required. A team that we did talk about being in demise uh, last week, I think, was Mayo, of course, after losing to Dublin and losing to Galway before that as well. Really good win for them down in your Tralee, Owen. Yeah, they were excellent, weren't they? They were absolutely fantastic. Um, like I've, I've said it on AM over the past couple of mornings, I thought Aidan O'Shea was just absolutely brilliant. And um, it's a very encouraging sign from Mayo's perspective. We have said this earlier in the year that the question marks around Mayo over the past couple of seasons have been how good are the kids? How good is this next generation of Mayo footballer? But realistically, if Mayo fans have any designs on winning all Ireland this year, the young kids will have to play a bit of a part. But the most encouraging sign is how the grizzled veterans are going for, for Mayo at the moment. And I thought, um, like when you look at some of the players that shone on, on Saturday, the, the term grizzled veteran has never been more true when it comes to the likes of uh, Barrett and Harrison. And like we had Keegan and Moore and Coman. Um, a very very briefly like once they come into the season fully once they, they start playing full 70 minutes in Warren's case it won't be a full 70 once they start starting games can we get back to 2017 last week you mentioned we were kind of writing the debt rights of Mayo I'm suddenly starting to think uh, in a lot more of an encouraging way from a Mayo perspective I, I think that glimmer of hope that they can get back to that level is there once again yeah and we've, we had an image up there on screen briefly we might get it up there again so it's the total this is from the RF uh, and 
at Ref Come On uh, Twitter page. So looking at the points from the from play during the league, Fionn McDonough is top with nine. Matt Ruan is next with six, which I presume is one three. Um, so two of the newer guys coming in getting lots of scores. And I was a bit concerned about some of these newer players that they weren't making a massive impact in the past couple of games, I, especially a couple of the guys who started on the inside line. But have you been impressed by the likes of Ruan and McDonough? Yeah, I think they're just getting better game by game. But I've said it before that at the inter-county level, you need probably a dozen dozen 15 18 games to really try and find your find your feet it's not most guys with the odd exception probably Connor Callaghan is the one exception or David Clifford that I can think of that you come in and absolutely just start ripping it up straight away it just doesn't happen it, it's a totally different game um, I think the top class uh, club footballer under 21 or even Sigerson I know there's not a huge jump but it is a different game I think um, these guys are, are really starting to show their mettle but as I was saying, I think as I said earlier, um, you know, you can't really read too much into the league. You know, if I'd have been this time last week, we would have said, look, at career starts to be in an Ireland final and stuff like this. And at the start of the league, you know, after Monaghan's win against Down, and now they're, they're struggling to stay in Division One. So look, at, they've only had, a, had one victory since. Yeah, I think Rowan's been defined as the league, hasn't he? He's definitely something that you can take from the league, and it's been. He has the makings of an elite. Look, like he, you wouldn't. Uh, if he was in a Dublin jersey, and someone said that's Brian Fenton out there, and I know it's a bit early days yeah. for it, but he's got that build and he's got that power. Yeah, I look at he, he. He has been exceptional, and the other goal he got in the end of it, and I, I've looked at it a couple of times, and he started with that ball probably back in his own forty-five, ran over a hundred meters, you know, in the late in the game to finish that, and you know, had been excellent, got a point from play as well. Um, but you know, I I kind of questioned the Kerry midfield the other night. Is, you know, Jack Barry, I think, is a good player, but I'm not certain about Mark Griffin as an inter-county midfielder. You know, he likes a David Moore or Tommy Walsh to come back in. But look again, Jack Sherwood was missing the other night. Uh, David Clifford was missing the other night. David Moore was missing the other night. Paul Ganey, Paul Ganey was. Missing the other night, James O'Donnell who was missing the other night, and then possibly a handful of, uh, or maybe two, three, Doctor Croaks players as well. All of a sudden, that's eight, eight, eight other players. So, you know, if uh, if I was uh, Peter Keane, I wouldn't be getting too worried about a, a narrow defeat in conditions like that in, in Tralee during, during March either. Oh, and you began the love in uh, of Aidan O'Shea earlier in this little section. Uh, we had Billy and Joe Patton on off the ball AM, and he uh, he was following I think similar the big lines. Positive for me was that you got some of your older players. Mm. played much better against Kerry than they did against Dublin. And then again, some of your young players built on some promising performances already in this in this league campaign, I suppose. And it starts all with Aidan O'Shea. And we've yeah. all talked about Aidan O'Shea over the last number of years, how to get the best out of him. And some people have said full forward. He's played a lot of football at centre forward. But his original impact for Mayo, in my opinion, was as a midfielder. And he probably got moved out of that position because he's so versatile. And Mayo had, I suppose, a lot of riches in that area with Barry Moore and, and Tom Parsons and, and Shamie O'Shea. And now when they don't have that, those, those players with Barry Moore retired and Tom Parsons injured, Shamey O'Shea is now injured also, they have to throw him back into midfield. And he responded, you know, a huge response. He was outstanding. And it wasn't a case where in the past, Shane, uh, Aiden has been accused of playing for 10 minutes and then not, not being involved for the next 15. He was constantly in the game. He was a physical presence on kickouts. His tackling was immense. He, he did a great job for me around the middle of the field, retaining and recycling possession. It was one of his best games in a long time, and he really dominated that middle third. And as a result, Kerry could not get into the game at any real stage. And he had a great help with Matthew Ruan, his club mate from Brafey, who also, who's one of those younger players who's developing, I suppose, really quickly um, in that Mayo midfield and they totally dominated that area and that was the platform for Mayo in terms of winning that game. Yeah, Aidan O'Shea was excellent um, the other day. He was also excellent in the second half when Mayo were trying to make a comeback against Galway as well. What about the, the flip side for Mayo? Um, I wonder about fullback because they struggled on Tommy Walsh again. Stephen Cohen was on him and in the past they've had to put Aidan O'Shea back fullback. Now the plus side is they've the best defence in Division 1 with just 71 points conceded. So have they an answer at fullback later in the summer? Um, but I think Jerk Africa wasn't playing the other night and you know he's physically he's a big man and can match Tommy Walsh but again look at it, it might sound boring but I just think it's about saying high ball in Danny and in Danny full back line one on one especially with someone the size of Tommy Walsh like Kieran Donahue caused problems for years again almost every full back he played simply because of his size and Tommy Walsh I think is something similar mm. and it's very hard to mark these guys one on one the best you're hoping for is kind of try and break the ball because you can't chance playing in front unless there's there could be a situation like the Dublin game the other night where the ball went over Davy Byrne and into Colin McShane and he should have had a second goal mm. um, so the, the, the kind of have to hedge your bets and maybe play from behind and a big man like that getting in front is very hard to very hard to stop him winning the ball 
We've been joined by Tommy Rooney as well. Tommy, how are you? Hi lads, how are you? What's the crack? Are there any of those younger players for, for uh, Mayo that really stand out to you? I was impressed by Plunkett at centre-back and especially when Boyle and Keegan weren't playing. Normally, a newer player like that, you'd have him in surrounded by the veterans. Yeah, Plunkett's been one of the main lads in that under-21 team over the last couple of years. Obviously, Ruan, who you mentioned earlier on. Fionn McDonough has been a, another find of the league. Yeah. Um, you could see the way Fergal Bowling and him combined for a couple of points during the, during the Kerry game last week. They were... They're fantastic. I think Horn has discovered a couple of players. Like I think he'd be happy with his league campaign so far. Really? Yeah. Mm. I really think he will be. It's kind of just been up and down, and we know there's permutations at the end of the league that that four teams can still get in. Well, Kerry are in there, but three teams. One hundred percent. But I don't think for Mayo they want to win a league title. I don't think they really care about that. Like James Horn's going back there after a couple of years out. He's had his finger on the pulse in the club scene. Um, I, and think, he's I think I think Mayo. I think, have every chance, I think Mayo have every chance of winning the league. Probably do. But I've, I've got a feeling. To, if you just look at the permutations, I've got a feeling. Galway are going to do very, very well to win in Oma. In fact, I don't think they are going to win in Oma. I think Mayo, Mayo are going to win uh, at home this weekend. That means Mayo are into a league final. They mm. play Kerry again. They had their number last week. It's in Croke Park. Mayo are on the, the upward trajectory in terms of fitness. Kerry seems to be going the other way. They, they looked out in their legs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And for me, that makes Mayo front runners to win the league. Uh, look, I just think Horn would be delighted with the league so far. Who, who would actually like to le- win the league the most? For belief. So you've got Kerry, Galway, Mayo, Tyrone. It's so good for any- anyone. It's good for any of them. But, but is there any team that needs it? I think Kerry possibly um, not that they're they're short on silverware but Kerry have, have probably more young fellas coming in than yeah. anybody else and possibly for them just for a bit of confidence to get a big game in Croke Park under the belt and to and to get a victory um, again I agree with the lads about Mayo I don't think it's to be all and end all of Mayo I think winning oh, I think winning Connacht will be a big big deal to them this year massively so but well, I don't I don't I don't think winning the winning the national league will be will be as much of course those Kerry boys all have won all Ireland's these young lads in Croke Park in the last couple of years you know. So who, they don't they don't need more silver. They really don't. Very interesting quotes from Aidan O'Rourke this week about uh, Kerry. He basically says the league has been wasted. And uh, I'll just read out um, an excerpt. The glaring reality for Kerry is that they do not have the individual defensive qualities to get into an open trade with the best teams in the country. The examples of Mayo runners opening the kingdom up in the highlights reel are plentiful and the most important conclusion is obvious. This Kerry team need a collective defensive plan that can give them a platform to unleash their undoubted ta- attacking potential. So essentially, they've got a, a world of stars, as we've named out, um, but they can't tackle. Is that unfair? Um, I possibly think it's a little bit harsh. I think Sean O'Shea, probably at the moment, is the best footballer in the country, and some of his tackling during the National League has been outstanding. He did give him credit, actually. And particularly the other yeah. night in, in really bad conditions. But, um, you know, it's, it's something we always say again a team really struggles when another team runs him, but so does every other team. Yeah. Uh, no team wants to be defending facing their own goal. If you have numbers behind the ball, have your back to your own goal, you're in a fine position. But when you're chasing guys uh, facing your own goal, you're in serious problems. But uh, I think uh, I'm not sure about them not being able to tackle. I think with Donny Buckley and uh, Tommy Griffin, who I know mm. Tommy is an absolute connoisseur, he just loves tackling. Um, we're way on a trip with him recently, playing a charity match. And uh, does the, the Kerry lads said themselves, he'd be happier to make a block than score four or five in a match. So <laughs> these guys, I think, come championship time, uh, not going to be too far off the mark. Exactly. The tackling. I th- it's like I think to say, to say it's, a, it's a little harsh is putting it lightly, to yeah. be honest. I think but have you, have you seen a change like Donny Buckley it's like yes. the return of the tackling a, messiah we had a segment here with Enda Varley talking about the swarm tackle and how impressive they were against Dublin exactly yeah. like that's we did that two weeks ago three weeks ago yeah. that's a, it's an evisceration for I haven't read on, piece. on the Kerry defence and it, he questions severely their character and how much desire they actually have he, he talks about how uh, it's an insult to you personally if your man beats you and that the Kerry lads the way their attitude was last weekend were getting beaten in one-on-one situations which in isolation is true for if 50 you, minutes you were winning it, the game it was 8-5 so it's I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making any bones about the fact that it was by some distance Kerry's poorest performance in the league they looked out on their legs in certain points but there were some strange things as well like I do wonder uh, how like you talk about we don't know how hard Dublin are training how wrecked are Kerry at the moment we don't know how hard they're training as well there was a full round of, of National League or County League games week mm-hmm. before like Jack Sherwood you said was mentioned uh, as somebody who was absent Kerry's potentially a, 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 a fill-in at full back he played a full game for his club the previous weekend and wasn't in the squad at all at the weekend so I, I don't know what happened there Graham O'Sullivan who I thought was unbelievable uh, the previous round didn't get uh, any minutes off the bench as well their tackling has been the biggest improvements uh, in terms of uh, one-to-one scale in terms of a system I think he's well off the mark yeah because he made it sound like remember when Zinedine Zidane was talking about Real Madrid selling McAlealy and he says why put another layer of gold uh, paint on the Bentley when you're losing the entire engine so it seems like 
you all fully disagree with this. I'll have to give it a read. I'll have to give it a piece of read. But, but I, I wouldn't think... I, the line that's out there was a carry of waste of the league. I really don't think so. They've had it fantastically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think... It was the best we started league since 1964 after five yeah, games. And the players that have come through, and not only the players that have come through, it's how much they've stood up in the leadership. But works. are there too many young players at one time? Like even just when you were involved so. at Wexford, do you, do you ever think, right, that's too many young lads in one go, even if they've talent? Unfortunately, we never we were never in that privileged position to be ringing in last night, Kerry, or at, at that rate and that number. But no, I, look, I, I I don't think the, the tackling thing is right. It's not something. I think actually over the first five weekends we would have been actually been mentioned the opposite to that, mm. where their swarm tackling and their their tackling one on one was actually quite good yeah. um, because their work rate again Dublin that night, even under pressure in the last ten minutes, I thought was excellent. But they've been, they've been doing it all league, you know, they've toughed out some really tough wins that Kerry wouldn't have been known for over the last couple of years in the league because Kerry are generally happy enough to flow through the league, stay in Division One. It's often come down to the last day mm. where they needed to win and invariably they forgot it yeah. so I agree I absolutely think to be to be more than happy with their league campaign Were you quoting Alan Halton there? When? You'll win nothing with kids I suppose I was paraphrasing <laughs> it in a way Well Adam. the thing is they may win nothing with kids so like I, I still hold on to the belief that, well, that yeah. it's next year and maybe bringing in all the young kids this year and having that little bit of chaos around the implementation of all the youngsters will be a good thing when we're sitting here in 12 months time I do think that they will run into issues like they did last Saturday multiple times again this summer I just don't think that they're close, close enough to perfection because cl you, every team other than Dublin needs to be very very close to perfect when this year is all Ireland and I do think the way Kerry are set up this year they're not going to reach perfection for another 12, 14, 15 months. Did it stand out to you in the poor conditions and against a really powerful team like Mayo that early on in the game, the amount of times that shots dropped short, the, the amount of times they were blocked down, uh, poor deliveries inside and the only person standing up was a fully grown 31 year old man Tommy yeah. Hodge yeah it's very, it, it is like you could, you could look at it as, as a big concern but I'd agree with Matty about midfield and the, the idea of Mark Griffin like I, I, we said here in the first Gaelic football show that I wanted to see Mark Griffin in at midfield and like fair play to Peter Keane for giving him a run out there and he was given that run out because when he's charging up from full back um, <laughs> I was wrong and uh, there, there is still a place for Mark Griffin in that team. It, whether or not he's going to be the midfielder now, I don't think it's going to be the case. Uh, like David Moore can't come back soon enough. He probably won't play the league uh, or, or any minutes of the league at this stage, even if they get to a league final. So they won't actually get to establish who is the number one kind of backup, or not backup, but the, the other midfielder alongside Moore until the summertime, which is another worry considering it's their weakest part of the game at the moment. And have you any more advice for Peter Keane? Well, you know, <laughs> uh, let me, let me, uh, who knows, yeah, um, bring, bring Kieran Donaghy back is actually my, uh, my one piece of advice. We're going to move on to Mead now in a second, but just before I do, we have to talk about the player of the week, the goat of the week. It had to be Matty Donnelly. I meant to mention this earlier, but look at him up there. Look at how happy he is with that performance the other day. I thought you were <laughs> going to give it to Hurling, man. How could I give it? Uh, who? Dahi Burke. Dahi Burke. Oh, man of the match. He was exceptional. Yeah. And we will definitely talk about Carl <coughs> Finn in a little while, but I just wanted to mention Matty Donnelly because I'd forgotten him. Um, we've got a video here with Andy McEntee. So he's he's teeing up this weekend's game for Clare, who are this weekend going to no, be playing Tipperary. Mana? Me, they're playing for Mana. Oh, are they? Sorry, yeah. I have the wrong I fixtures here. Yeah. I can't even blame anyone because I pasted down those fixtures myself. Yeah. But anyway, this is um, Andy McEntee's call to arms. Hello everyone, I'd, just, uh, I'd like to encourage everybody to come out and support the team next week. Uh, it's very important to us, the management, and very important to the players. They really got uh, great support from you guys in the last uh, number of games and uh, hopefully it'll be a day to celebrate with, with uh, friends and family alike. So I really would like to see as many people as possible in, uh, in Park Talton next week. Tommy, 112-17 to win over Clare. Um, how impressive have Meath been? They're they're two points clear of Fermanagh and Donegal. Yeah, but and you know points differential really favours them. But uh, how, how impressive have they been? They're going to get the well, league final. I'll, I'll talk about uh, last Sunday. It was meant to be Saturday. The game was cancelled, but the Sunday, so preparations were kind of thrown. Mm. I happened to I happened to be down in Ennis, and there was a, a strong um, Mead crowd down there for the game. I think there's a really good vibe around the county at the minute. Yeah. Um, what I'll say about the game was is that it was a funny game. Clare scored one one from play, and that was it. So, uh, there was times though when it was quite edgy. Mead had a black card 10 minutes before the, first, the end of the first half. Shane Gallagher went off and then they got a black card um, when Gallagher came back on when Brian Mentham went off. So, they essentially played with 14 men for 20 minutes. There was a swirling wind and yeah, it was a funny game. Mead looked really classy at times. Started a game, they scored two points, points straight from the throw and won the young lads eating the vine. Then Derek Campion, who had started scoring this tra trademark outside the right boot point, added a second. And then they allowed Clare to get back into it. They were four points up and Clare got a goal on the break. They opened meet up quite, quite easily. Um, 
And until Graham Riley came on the second half, Mead didn't really up with a gear again. But when he did come on, Mead looked a different class. Um, I think this Mead team, I think there's a lot of silky footballers. I think they know where they're strong. They have a lot of very good runners. I think the way McEntee has them set up, they're playing to their strengths and that's it. I think one man, he's actually been, he's been named on a couple of teams of the week this week, but uh, he stood out to me on the day itself, was the fullback Conor McGill. So McGill is, is 25, he's an animal of a man. He's uh, six foot two or three, he's fast, he's athletic, rangy, good on the ball. Thank he's been there, well, not really, no. But like, <laughs> connor has been there for a couple of years, but Conor's always had a couple of injuries every, every season. So, so he'd get a run, he'd be the main man, and then he'd, he'd, he'd have to miss out in a couple of weeks. So he's be, his, I suppose his, his momentum's been stunted. But he was just brilliant. Like Claire, Claire David Tubbery in the full forward line, um, Gary Brennan, like loads of good players in that team. But Mead, in places, looked a class above. I would say they've got a lot of lads like James McEntee and Kenny O'Sullivan and Brian McMahon and Ronan Ryan and Graham Riley who are very good at breaking the line and playing the system that McEntee likes playing. I think they're missing another man or two like Conor McGill, a big man. Um, like McGill just looked like he was on a, another planet really at times in that game. He was shoving boys off the ball. The same way Aidan O'Shea might do in a, in a game to a lesser extent. Mead I think are missing maybe a man like that but they're in great shape for promotion. Um, what you were asking there, are they pretty much essentially promoted? They are. They're on 10 points. Um, they're playing for Mana, Donegal are playing Kildare, so it's Mead on 10, Donegal on 8, Fermanagh on 8 and Kildare on 7. So essentially, for Mead not to go up, we need to see something like uh, Fermanagh beating Mead by 10 points at the weekend and Donegal beating Kildare by 7, which would leave all teams on, three point, on 10 points and Donegal with a, a scoring difference of 12, Fermanagh on 11 and Mead on 10. So for that sort of a swing to happen, I can't really see it. I can't really see Mead not going up to Division yeah. 1, which is great. For men, I don't really score that, that much. You, can't, you just like, can't see it happen. Can't see it happen, to be honest with you. I think Mead have been on the precipice of this for a couple of years. Um, they've been there, thereabouts, and I'd love to see what's going to happen now in Division 1 next year. I hope to God it's not like West Mead a couple of years ago where they got eight hammerings. If you can be competitive and you can learn from the best, well, then you're moving on. Because Mead have a lot of good young lads, and it's just moving those players on another level. Hmm. I don't know how much you've seen of Mead, but do you think they're on the way back? I do, I'm delighted to see it because look at the Leinster Championship certainly needs me anyway, but the Championship in general and delighted Randy McIntyre as well, I think they were, they were fairly harshly done by against Tyrone in, in Avon last year, um, you know, it was a game that they probably should have won and you know, I think the, the football needs me, the Championship needs me and I said Leinster in particular, but you know, they've won games this year um, that in the last couple of years they certainly wouldn't have won, I think they had a poor performance at home at the start against Tipperary and still ground out a result mm -hmm. and you know, the same against Kildare and stuff like that and it's great to see and you know, I've to be honest, I find it hard to see him messing it up this weekend. It has to be a kind of an extraordinary set of results for him not to go up. And you know, it's very hard to see for man out scoring by by ten points in Navan. And I think that the, the the belief that these these victories have given him look, going away to Clare is no handy feat. We've done it on several occasions, and with 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 good teams and there's better teams than Mead and Wexford went down and lost in Ennis um, so like, that's a, that's an excellent victory away I was a bit surprised to be honest when I heard it even though Mead are top of the table Ian Kearns was saying um, I think last season that he's kind of in a way relieved that Tipperary didn't get up to Division 1 and you look now Tipperary are they're joint last basically they're one of three teams that are on three points at the foot of the table in yeah. Division 2 now he's had huge injuries missing mm. 10 players Quindlevin. times whatever. a lot of boys gone yeah. yeah so for Mead is this the right time for them to be going up to Division 1 I think it has to be because, like, what, what are you doing if you're not playing Division One football? Like, me, they're one of those counties that have been in kind of a nothing kind of a, a sphere for the last couple of years. They've not been there. They're not they're competing. Arsenal. But they're not competing for a Leinster title. They really aren't, because Dublin are just a world away. I think 2013 was the last time I actually believed Mead might beat Dublin in a game in Crow Park, or Mead might do something. Um, I might be forgetting where that West Mead comeback was, but I think 2013 against Dublin was the last time I really believed it might happen. So, like, we were then knocked out of the qualifiers last year. Unfortunately, it was like a record uh, knockout for Mead. It was the earliest they were knocked out in maybe 12 years. Um, so, like, if they don't go to Division 1, what are they doing? Like, what's the point of lads like Killian O'Sullivan and Conor McGill and Graham Riley and Donald Kogan playing football if they're not going to be playing against the best? I would say the aim is to get to the Super 8s and see what happens from there. That would be the, the, the biggest success story of the year. But go, getting to Division 1 fo uh, Division one football is a step forward in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And as long as it's not, like West Mead, going up and then straight back down to Division 3 or 4. It won't be. It it won't I don't be. think it will be it's either. The, the comparison here is Ross Common to their level. And then That's your how, how do you not... Like, Kildare obviously have been stung very, very badly with personnel issues uh, over the last since they got to the Super Rates last year. Ross Common have gone through different periods as well. Like Meath can get to that level easily in, in the next twelve months. It's how do they get on to the level beyond that again and do what Monaghan are doing. Yeah. When we heard when I heard Maddie was coming on I couldn't help but uh, head on to YouTube and go to two thousand and eight and that comeback. 
Against Meath. Against Meath. 11 points down, was it? I think it was nine and a half time. It was t- no, it was ten and a half time, yeah. and we'd, we'd got it back to about six, and he goes ten again with 20 minutes to go. Yeah. That was one of the good deserts. Look, just on the, on the topic of Mead, I'd love to see Mead going back up because I think they're actually on an upward curve where Tipperary have had a couple of really good seasons. We're in Munster finals and yeah. all Ireland quarter final. And I think they might have been on the way in a very small bit and it's not been harsh, but I think Mead are moving in the right direction to be we the We got to a team. semi-final, damn you, Matty. We got to an All-Ireland yeah. semi-final. Sc- excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's debate time. Oh, and I don't think we had a, a debate last week, did we? No, like I guess after the absolute trouncing I, I found it out over the first couple of weeks, there was no point even debating anything really over the last couple wow. of weeks. But it's fine, you're back and it seems that you've got a bit of fire in the belly, do you? Yeah, it just seems to me your ability to, to trick yourself, to fool yourself into thinking we won those debates is incredible. It is incredible. Tommy, do you want to... So I, I might kick it off here, I'm just reading it on screen. The debate this week seems to be, is Stephen Cluxon still the best keeper around? So who wants to kick off here? Owen, what side ahead. are you taking? Of course he is. I actually, that's a, it's beyond kind of the, the point of debate really now. Like just first of all, I've never really kind of bought the sort of all-time greatest player, most important, influential, get a footballer you've ever seen nonsense. I do think he has been consistently the best uh, goalkeeper in Gaelic football uh, for about 10-15 years at this point. Uh, everything really, the, the way he instigate Dublin's uh, attacks, his kick-out level, the way he has had a bit of a hand in the changing face of Gaelic football, even though I wouldn't really overplay his influence that much. And the fact that a man is but he's still going pretty well like I mean the look at his performances over the last couple of seasons like can you actually give me an appreciable decline I don't think so people talk about the high ball in on top of him really and like has that just been more of an exploiting of Stephen Cluxon over the last couple of years or has that actually been a weakening of Stephen Cluxon over the last couple of years I think it's certainly the former like really has there been a decline in his performances I don't think so I, I just I just really don't see that this uh, in evidence anywhere and I think there's an absolute massive knee jerk going on here the point where I, I just don't understand why this is a debate. <laughs> Sheehan, you're up. Shane, here you go. As ever, he said very little there. Yeah, the high ball, you can't ignore the fact that the high ball, he does strung, struggle under it. Does Jim Gavin think he should start anymore? I'd ask that. Evan Comerford has started four games this year. Monaghan, Galway, Kerry and Mayo. So he's obviously looking to the future. Cluxton has started just two. I think that's very telling because when has that happened before? Cluxton plays every game. If you look at uh, the uh, opposition, the, the guys who would be challenging him, Niall Morgan, the, f- the fly goalkeeper, he was incredible the other day. Um, if you look at Graham Brody, he can carry the ball out just like Niall Morgan. Rory Began can do the same. Do you think that uh, at 37 years of age, 38 later this year, that Stephen Cluxton can carry the ball outfield and be that extra you don't need at the back? Who, who asked you? <laughs> it was a rhetorical question. He can't. Whereas you saw Niall Morgan driving out from the back time after time going past two players. And I don't think at 38 years of age that Stephen Cluxton is going to be introducing that to his game anytime soon. And I'm not sure he wants contact anymore when he comes out. That James McGivney hit last year, I don't think stood to him overall. <laughs> I think it's pretty obvious. The stats last year, Carroll Kane what did a load a load piece of bollocks. showing that Began had the, a better season than Cluxton. You're putting Stephen Cluxton, you're, you're projecting how we judge Niall Morgan onto Stephen Cluxton here. The question here is, is Stephen Cluxton still the best goalkeeper around? So we're working off a base here, which is pretty obvious that Stephen Cluxton is one of the best goalkeepers we've ever Ever seen in Jim Gaelic Gavin. games. Jim Gavin so we're, 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 is we're working his selections. Your, your point basically, are you actually going as far as to say that Stephen Cluxton was never, that the current Niall Morgan is better <coughs> than the peak Stephen Cluxton? Because that's certainly what, what argument you're making there, because you're talking uh, about the stylistic differences that we see between Niall Morgan and Stephen Cluxton. Great, you've got a fly goalkeeper if you need a fly goalkeeper like Tyrone needed at the start of the, the league when they were terrible up front. Now suddenly they're kicking the ball into their forwards a little bit more and Niall Morgan's influence in terms of an attacking force has waned a little bit. Why is that? It's because of their attack. If Dublin had crap forwards, then they might actually utilise Stephen Cluxon a little bit more. But they don't. They're a pretty good football team, and we're talking about him as an all-time great. Yeah. I, think that's a, I think that's a pretty good record for I a I just think it's pretty simple. He, he's not going to be able to continue to adapt with the, the newer range of goalkeepers or the younger guys. What's he have to adapt to, though? But like, look at Niall Morgan now. Look at what Gra- and Graham Brody's doing, and look at what, um, look at what Rory Bacon do is doing. Cluxon's going They're making up for deficiencies elsewhere in their team. Cluxon no? has never done it in various. Yeah, he's, he's never, never been a fly goalie. Yeah, but like, he's even stopped taking the freeze like he used to before, which I found very strange. Now maybe that's something to do with. Well, in fairness, Dean, Dean Rock, Rock. Dean Rock's uh, since twenty thirteen strike 14. rate hasn't been too shabby either. You know, so who said you on here? I'm neutral. I'm fair. He is not starting him as much. Why? Why isn't he starting him as much? I think he's just giving comfort to Ron. Absolutely, and I think Jim Gavin did to me. The Tyrone match the other night looked like a game that Dublin needed and really wanted to win and all of a sudden he's back in goal mm. and I think to me to me that 
kind of says it I all. I think when you're looking at Dublin and yeah. comfort's not there, comfort's starting, it's a completely different thing. You can actually get at Dublin here. Yeah. You know, if, if Dublin are playing in a country and comfort's in goal, you're thinking you can get at Dublin here. They both have a 50% win rate um, from their games I, this I, year. They're judging on the league. Like, did you just, did you just say Cluxton's finished based on the 2019 uh, league campaign? No, no, no. I said he's on the wane. I think that's enough. Like, I, I really, like, so he... And, and other keepers are starting to do things that he can't. Oh, I, I, just, I just think that you're talking something different here. You would have faced Stephen early in his career, so you've seen a lot of this. What, what, what would you think? I think, I think he's still absolutely still at it. He's, whatever you said, 38 going on 39 this year. Tur- sorry, 37 going on 38. There's not many guys at that age playing inter-county football, first of all, at all. But there's certainly not many that are going to keep going that way. I, think, I, don't, I don't agree that he's on the way, and I'd say he might, I wouldn't even say stagnated, but at this stage of his career, how much better can he get? He probably can't get a whole lot better. But I know if I had a choice of the two Dublin goalkeepers in the morning, I know which one I'd be picking. Well, like 18 months ago, was he not nominated for a footballer of the year? And Rory Began, yeah, and didn't get an All-Star. That's Began's first mention, uh, I think. Uh, no, I was trying to talk to about Rory Began. <laughs> and I was bringing up stats, I just didn't have the time. Uh, Carol Kane did a piece in the Irish News last year and he basically proved statistically that Rory Began had a better season than him. And there they up, there they are up there. Errors leading to goal. Two for Cluxton, one for uh, Began. Goal conceded six each. I'm not going to read through them. But like, just after a minute here, Shane, you're it, making it, these points as well. It boiled down to Be- Begin had a better season. K- Kildare had a better season than Mayo right. last year. They knocked them out of the championship. Are you so all of a sudden saying that Kildare are a better team than Mayo? Like, we, we, we rush into this idea that one season or one very small snapshot but it's uh, because makes he's, a player. He's now 38. Now it takes a, you're overreacting. You're, you're completely. As, as if like last season was a, a calamity for Stephen Cluxton. Like, every goalkeeper you can look at and say, this isn't working for him, this isn't working for him. Like, if it comes to the kickout, if it comes to the ditch, distribution off the tee which is so key to Dublin I wouldn't have anybody else there like, the thing is Cluxon isn't on the wane yet Messi isn't on the wane Ronaldo isn't on the this wane this is like and a Tom dog Brady pile on top of me here <laughs> I just I, disagree I, with you I think if he was a 37 year old midfielder we could possibly be talking about him on the wane but because of what he has to do in his position I think we could be and he's so little, essential he's so essential to the team going over the top one we're going to move on. Who's, who's won? Basically, who's oh, won? It, who's won the debate? Like, in such a dominant team, for us to still be talking about a goalkeeper is actually such a testament to what Stephen Cluxton does. Yeah, we have to move on. Matty, who won it? If I, uh, I have the two lads definitely won the debate. It was two against one there. Oh, I won the debate. <laughs> <laughs> and isn't easy the best or not, but who actually debated it better? So, yeah, I'm going to give it to myself. Um, we're, we're going to move on to the tactics board and also we'll talk about Cara Finn as well and how they've changed the face of club football, I suppose. Billy Joe Padden spoke on Off the Ball AM about their impressive win and hammering of Dr. Croaks. The thing that impressed you most nearly about Curfin is the way they're playing the game. And they don't seem to be relying on, uh, while they have a couple of exceptional footballers, they don't seem to have to rely on them. They've got strength throughout the team, throughout the squad. And then they just seem to be all buying into the game plan and they all know their exact role in that really, really well. And, And as a result, you get this sort of performance that's so coordinated it looks orchestrated and they just you know move the ball up the field with such ease no one is having to do too much there's runners with every player that has the ball they've always got support and it just looks like the simplest thing in the world and it really is a, a great example of how Gaelic football should be played yeah it looks like the simplest thing in the world but yeah. is it hard to actually put into action no doubt and you've got to give credit to the players themselves but I think all uh, as, as much the coaches that have dealt with these players for years and years like Kerfin have always had strong, strong underage. And they've all, you know, always had good senior teams in Galway. But I, I think that to get to the level where they're at now, it's not just down to, you know, Kevin O'Brien, his management team of these last couple of years, or, or you know, even Stephen Rockford managed them to an all Ireland club before. It's, it's, it's the coaching they've got all through up since they're eight, nine, ten years old, that they've played this way of football. It's ingrained in every single one of them that this is how they want to play. So then when it comes into the biggest day in, in the club calendar, they're just dealing with what they know and they're just performing the roles that they've all performed, whether it be through underage football and up. And that's why they or that's how they're able to reach this level of excellence. Yeah, for the second season in a row, Cara Finn were absolutely glorious in the all Ireland Club final. One thing that seems to have come out on the back of this is why aren't other county teams playing the way Cara Finn do? And I saw what Mike Quirk wrote here. You'd imagine those lads who'll be making themselves available to Kevin Walsh's Galway side in the next week or so won't be bursting with enthusiasm to go back in and start playing the type of defence-focused football we've seen from the county side so far throughout the league. First of all, do you think that's a fair or unfair comment? 
Um, it'd be a bit of both to be honest. Like Corrafin aren't a team to just kicks the ball the whole time either. Like some of their best scores were, were kind of ran the length of the field the other day. Um, like that goal that Gary Sy scores was, mm, was hand passing all Yeah, it was place. walked into the goal from the halfway line. Mm. In fairness, it was all hand passing. It wasn't as if it was two, three quick hand, hand pass. You were at one end of the field, the other in six, eight seconds. So um, I'd say it'll be a few of the Corrafin lads. I'd be, be quite happy to head back into Galway after the National League and, and start preparing for a championship on the back of what's been an unbelievable season for them. Look, they absolutely played great football, but I think club football in Croke Park compared to inter county football. I think it's, it's two totally different things and we've said it on numerous occasions just look at the games there seems to be an awful lot more space in Croke Park when, when there's club games as compared to inter-county games the game is not near as congested and you know it's not near as choked up but, you know, just purely because of the conditioning of um, inter-county players compared to most club players and obviously I know the likes of Crokes and, and, and um, what do you call them are not far off inter-county standard um, you know I think Corrafin would probably definitely win Division 4 and I think would more than hold their own Division 3 and possibly be, be teams in Division 2 inter-county teams so but it just it, to me it looks totally different when it, from an inter-county game compared to, to club I actually put that up on Twitter the other day what division would Corrafin be in the National League and, I, and there's probably a couple of responses coming up here yeah I said I'd go with Division 2 myself because they have an awful lot of inter-county players that would be playing on the Galway panel like some of them are in there yeah. obviously the likes of Michal Lundy Ian Burke Dahi Burke is a Galway hurler uh, Kieran Gary Fitzgerald. Sice Martin Gary Farrell to be, to be, inter- or yeah. to be, to be inter-county teams would love to have a forward line like Absolutely. that Absolutely a couple of the responses as well sorry Tommy I'll get you in one yeah, second no um, Aidan Healy says I'd say they would nearly bait Galway Division 2 pushing for promotion Sean Dooley says easily Division 2 and possibly low Division sorry easily Division 3 possibly low Division 2 there's few standouts but there's 18 solid inter-county standard players there Tommy just with Cara Fane at the weekend I think what it was was the coming to fruition of a, of a beautiful thing it was their nursery it was their academy essentially what they've been exposing as a football club for whatever the last 20 years they've been building towards this but like you can't forget that there's a, there's a headline from six months ago in November awful go away football final leaves the purists in state of depression they had a 7-7 draw a last, a last second equaliser against Mount Bellew like if you think if you're going to throw Cara Fane into Division 2 football like they came up against Crokes the weekend who were happy to play ball against them so Crokes were going out playing their own game Cara Fane were playing their own game and Cara Fane were the better outfit on the day but I think if say they were playing uh, I don't know another club who were maybe underdogs against Cara Fane um Let's see, what would, what would uh, Guido have done? What way would Guido have played against them if they were to set up to try and beat Carfin? I think they could have been spoiled. So I don't know if they'd you know, directly go into the Division 2. Well, what division would they go in? I don't know, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Place them in Division 2. Well, you can't four. just stand there and tell me I'm wrong. Tell me why you're right. Oh, that's what I'm saying, is they're right. It's like we saw Carfin go up against a team like Dr. Croaks. I need a division them, here. I need to hear them on their t- Played them in their game, you know? So it's division. Like, I said three. Three, okay. Um, what was I going to say? <laughs> when you were playing with the county, did you ever play any of the club champions or teams that were going into all Ireland semi finals at the start of the year? No, I suppose that time of the year you'd been back playing with your club anyway. Yeah. So, you know, even though there was no there was no month of April now where it's, it's all club, we still would have been playing club championship. Um, yeah. So we never ended up. We played, I think, the, the, one of the Wexford teams I coached with in, I think, 2016 or 17 played St. Vincent's. Um, I think they weren't far, too, far away from an Ireland club final, and that was a bit of an eye opener, tell you the time oh. my that were uh, exceptional absolutely fan- so you would have been a division 4 team and they would have beaten you comprehensively absolutely yeah and this is the point I'd make that I think that some of these some of the best clubs in both codes would do pretty well uh, at the inter-county game as well yeah, I suppose look at it we had been competing at the top of division 4 and they beat us comp- comprehensively I suppose you could say look at yeah. um, the other division 4, 3 team whatever but you know we weren't at a top division 4 team at, at the time but look I still got a, got a nice beating from them and what about the, the style of play? Because people are, are now talking about why aren't other sides playing like Cora Finn? And I would have thought, well, Cora Finn at club level have the sort of the quality of players that Dublin have at county level, that they're streets ahead of most teams. So I don't think it's as, as easy as saying, well, just apply their style of football to a county team and it'll work That's perfectly. Not, it's not that straightforward. Look, if it was, we'd have, we'd have lovely games of football every day of the week. There were 216 to 350 every day, but it's not. Teams have to cut their cloth to suit, and um, I think particularly you look at the likes of you know Fermanagh and Leitrim. Even you know they're probably two. Of the, I know that Fermanagh are still struggling to make it up in the league, but Leitrim already have. I think they're two of the standout performers with really limited players and really limited opposition, and they have to do what suits them. And you know they're not scoring three fifteen every day, but they're still getting victories. And you know to say <laughs> that you can just apply um, Cora Finn's type of football to everyone else, I don't think it's, I just don't think it's that straightforward, yeah. unfortunately. So we'll just do a small bit of uh, of the tactics board here as well. When you were involved with. Uh, Wexford and you're trying to, to coach forwards because that's what you are, you were a forwards coach. How do you try and um, teach good movement? 
Look, I suppose, in, in my opinion, the day of six hours playing into the disposition is probably long gone at this stage. Um, what you're trying to do, what we would have tried to do was put our half hour line maybe out, something like that. Um, these three guys just playing here is just far too easy. A defender stands inside here. The only place this guy can run is in straight lines. So what we would, would have tried to do was something like that. You need one guy close to goal at all times. We would have played, most teams play with a guy in the half forward line. So we, essentially we had two centre half forwards. Um, your two wing forwards kind of defend now anyway, drop back into midfield, midfielders into the half back line. Um, so what we would have tried to do, and to be honest, a little bit of um, what Tyrone were doing the other night reminded me of where, you know, a guy is coming up here attacking. Uh, the first guy moved towards the ball, opens a huge space here. You get your first defender or your first or your inside forward coming this way and cutting back into a huge space with ball, with diagonal ball being kicked. You know, if your half forward line will stay here, it will actually hold the half back line as well, rather than letting your four defenders drift back in. So, you know, I mean something like that. Plus, these two guys, rather than just being side by side in here, where it's very, where it is easier for the two defenders just to cover them on the outside. Um, with possibly if, this, if we've called this guy the sweeper, if he covers in here, you know, it's just easy. The ball is coming up this side. He'll drift across here. The other defender will drift goal side here. It's easier to defend. But just I I feel in this position is what we would have tried to do. If you have your sweeper here. Guy coming up here, the first place that the sweeper's going to go here is, is this side, which suits perfect here. Defender, quick run inside, cut your run, and you run into a huge amount of space there with hopefully you know, some kind of a support run coming through there, through there, you know, through the middle. Mm. But look at said it's, it's rather easy to do here. We found it a lot more difficult to actually do it on the field, but it's one way of creating space, but you have to have forward staying up the field. Plus, I just think if you have two guys up here, you know, if the game gets very stretched where you've got a lot of, defend, a lot of forwards, dropping back here um, you know you can just pull these guys a bit further and they're still on for a kick pass even from your own 45 they're still reachable with a kick pass rather than having two guys standing in here three defenders in front of them and all your half forward line down the field but I said look at this it's it's very easy to do it here and it definitely won't go wrong here but I think try, trying to coach it and actually trying to get guys to buy into it is, is that bit harder it's something that I would have done with, with the club lads over the last couple of years and I certainly would have, would, would have felt that it's worked very well where we went from just not being able to score goals or even creating chances to, to creating goal chances and scoring goals probably every day we went out. Mm. And then one final point then, we have an image here of Cormac Costello and both he and many of the Dublin forwards, they have this knack of being able to turn the defender either away from them or away from the ball which creates an advantage either way. You can see his marker at this point is not looking at the ball that's been carried in and you can see the, uh, I think it's underlined there, that's Niall Scully with the ball. He eventually gives it off to, I think it might be Brian Fenton. And uh, basically you can see how many of the players are either not looking at their man or looking at the ball. How hard is it to, to coach that into a forward to be able to turn that defender all the time? It's about moving because the defender, he can't see both. So if you, if, if you just go back to your kind of traditional three-man full forward line here. So the defender, they've called the defender white guy, he will play inside you. He's able to play side on and he can see the ball and he can also see you. Where I suppose in this position, um, you know, you have your, your sweeper there even. Uh, you get your defender. Now, if he stands one side of you, you've obviously a huge amount of space here. The same over here or the same with this guy out here. So I thought what you want your defender to be doing or your attacker inside to be doing is making little cut runs. So you're going three, three or four yards to the side where you know the ball is not coming and then cutting back because the defender has to react to you. Um, and especially if he can't see the ball coming in. You know, happy days, but it's about moving from the forward. And I think we seen a, a clip the other night uh, near, in the second half. I think Gavin O'Brien was standing in front of the goal um, in the Kerry Mayo match, where he literally just stood. And there's a, there's a one of the Kerry guys coming through with the ball. All he has to do is make a movement because the Kerry the, the Mayo defender is looking at the ball, but he doesn't move, which means there was no ball can be kicked from the outside. So it has to be constant movement inside. I looked at James. I don't know who. A couple of years ago in Croke Park, I think it was again Galway, uh, from behind the goal, and he was just back and forward, and it was literally along the 14, 14 and 21, back and forward all day, and it's a nightmare. Defenders, I think, like running, in, any lads, def uh, defenders are cornerbacks. No. Defenders I, love running yeah. in straight lines. They yeah. don't want to have to go left, go right, go backwards. Or oh, kills your legs. I think it's all about movement, yeah. um, and particularly, you know, because eight times out of ten, they're not getting the ball. Is that how you played inside, Matty? Would you have been making runs all over the place? Yeah, and look, I came through a decent bit of coaching, but look, you start to learn stuff as you go along as well, and you see what defenders don't like. Shane is dead right like they, they can't look at both if you stand he can absolutely look at both yeah. he stand beside you and put his arm across you but when you're constantly on the go I think they just find it an awful lot more of a handful and I think if you look at any of the good forwards now they're just they're, they never stop you know because two of the men that we we talk about a lot when it comes to this you mentioned James Dunne there and Andy Moran the two of them as inside forwards they'd be smaller men than you'd be yeah. so like you can obviously use your size as well Yeah. Um, would you ever have been tempted to just do that just to stand well not just to stand but use no, your but size 
now and again, and look, it worked on some occasions, but look, every, the ideal ball for the forward is the ball is bouncing out in front because you want to turn and get a defender facing his own goal. Like, I could stand under a high ball, um, but like, for it was probably only near the end of my career and particularly more so with club, where it not who would have stood, but where the high ball started to become an option, where I you know, probably got, sorry, got a good bit uh, physically bigger. But, um, you know, I think you still can't beat the movement and I think to this day it's working and defenders hate being turned and twisted. You know, they really want to just run in straight lines and they're very happy when they are because also by running in a straight line, you're running straight away from your own goal. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you're running sideways back and forth and Andy Moore is a great example of that where he's, he, he, you'd hardly see him winning the ball outside the 21 metre line in the whole match. That's, he's sideways all the time. That's a trick and it's like one of the challenges that you'd see a lot, especially with club teams, is that when they're trying to play a system like this and they're not fully used to it, the forwards get drawn out. So yep. winning the ball out around the 40 or around the 35, I'm sure they're happy days. Defenders are laughing. Yeah, just also on, on what I was saying earlier, you know, but this, this kind of also leaves us by going sideways. It always means you have targets well inside your 45. You know, a few of your normal guys here, you make the run 20, you're probably starting on the 14, 20 on, you make the run, all of a sudden you're on the two guys in the 45, you still haven't got the ball, and now we've absolutely no target inside, which puts huge pressure on you out here. Just this inside by just moving sideways. It will always give you targets. You know, you make a run, you don't get it. You're back to the middle again. You go the other way, and you always have something to hit from further out the field. Now, look, that's not bringing blanket defences into it. Dublin have become expert at moving the ball from side to side and eventually finding a gap up the middle. And they're not only side to side; they're hugging the touch lines. Mm. Guys are on both sides of the field. But as I said, it's, it's simple enough to do it here, but it's a bit trickier in, in mm. real life. Interesting stuff. Thanks very much, Matty. No that's problem. that's it for the Gaelic Football Show this week. We'll be back again next week at twelve thirty on Wednesday. Tomorrow's the Hurland Show at twelve thirty p.m. Uh, 3 p.m. in fact. Um, we'll see you then.